Hello, and thanks for joining today's deal-making webinar. Uh, my name is Matt Toole, the Director of Deal Intelligence at Refinitiv, and uh, pleased to be joined today by my colleague in London, Lucille Jones, uh, who is a member of the Deal Intelligence team uh, in London, and we'll be walking you through some of the key themes that we're seeing uh, within investment banking and capital markets uh, for the first half of, of 2022. A bit of housekeeping, uh, if you do have questions, there's a Q&A box and we'll be monitoring that box throughout, <laughs> throughout the webinar and we'll leave time at the end as well if there are any questions or clarifications on any of the data. And then also if in the resource center, you'll see a number of resources, including uh, blogs, uh, and, uh, some of our quarterly reviews and some of our, our, our product information uh, around investment making and capital markets for the first half of, of the year. So as we get started, um, you know, I think as we often do each quarter, we can kind of look at the key themes within investment banking, um, capital markets, and m and a. it's uh, It's certainly been a very interesting first half of the year uh, from an investment banking perspective. So we'll walk through some of the key the key themes. And where we generally like to start is looking at overall investment banking uh, investment banking fees. And over the past number of weeks, we've seen investment banking, uh, earnings coming from many of the U.S. banks and uh, moving into the, the European earnings season. Um, but looking at just kind of the overall headlines, no surprise to see, you know, overall investment banking fees were down 30 percent compared to the first half of 2021. Uh, and I think, you know, it's interesting to look at, you know, what a behemoth uh, of a year 2020, 2021 was from an investment banking fee perspective across uh, nearly every category, uh, equities, debt, syndicated loans, and, and M&A. And so, you know, although we are down 30% from last year, we are still at a very highly elevated level. And actually, the first half of this year is the third largest year-to-date for investment banking fees since we began tracking fees in 2000. And so, you know, despite the headlines of a kind of a very decreased environment, it is, um, you know, really looking at what was a record year across investment banking last year, particularly in M&A, traditional IPOs, SPAC IPOs, corporate bonds. Uh, and so, you know, last year, I think, will we'll really be, you know, one to, you know, certainly point to as, you know, a, um, you, know, a you know, obviously a, a very memorable year from an investment banking perspective. But, you know, again, the chart on the left really shows that we are still at a, at a pretty highly elevated level. Um, you know, from an overall asset class perspective, we are seeing ECM fees down uh, at the, the most significant, uh, down 72% compared to a year ago, and that is including traditional IPOs, follow-ons, convertibles, and SPACs, which have um, certainly taken uh, a bit of a, a backseat compared to where they were last year. Bonds down 26% compared to a year ago, loans down 9%, and completed M&A down 6%, and, and that is completed. So many of the deals that were announced over the last year or two are still moving through the pipeline um, and then and, and moving into the completed category, and that's when we see the fees come into uh, to our analysis. And so, you know, that is one that, that's a little bit different than the capital markets uh, pieces. There is a bit of a, a, bit of a delay, and, and obviously risk, as we do see deals not completing, falling through, uh, and changing over the course of, of, of time. From a regional perspective, you can see, you know, kind of how outsized the Americas was um, last year and continues to be, um, you know, kind of post-financial crisis, the share of investment banking fees coming from America's fee payers, um, you know, obviously on a very, on a pretty, you know, strong trajectory over, you know, the, the decade post-financial crisis, you know, a very large spike last year and a pretty large decline um, year over year. America is down 38% compared to a year ago. You know, EMEA down 35%, and then Asia uh, down down 14%. And we always do uh, point out the interplay between the fees coming from Europe and Asia, which you know have um, you know kind of been you know depending on when you look at it, whether it be quarterly or uh, at a year-to-date or full year level. You know, Asia is now eclipsing um, you know the the share from from Europe um, from a fee payer perspective. And so interesting to see kind of that. Um, and how that might play out, you know, depending on on how we continue to move through um, you know, this this new era and a new cycle within investment banking. From a quarterly perspective, we did see you know a, a pretty strong decline in in the second quarter of last year. Um, you know, for the first time in eight quarters, we're seeing fees below 30 billion. But you know, pointing out again, still highly elevated to um, you know what was kind of the you know the post financial crisis decade where we saw you know kind of a, you know pretty 
pretty you know, kind of um, you know kind of choppy uh, you know fee um, you know kind of tally depending on you know, kind of which asset class was doing particularly well. Um, whether it be you know the bond market or the equity market or you know you know some M and A, you know really in 2014 we began to see these you know kind of um, you know the M and A transactions um, you know kind of really come back and and obviously you know seeing consistently you know over 25 billion dollars in fees you know really from 2016 all the way through until you know the 2020-21 um, era. So again, I, I think still you know a, a sharp decline in Q2. Um, but I think you know certainly um, you know there are still areas of, of of strength, and we'll walk through those as we move through um, the rest of this presentation. From an overall banking perspective, you know it is interesting to see the share of the Americas banks uh, and, and banks domiciled in in the Americas, um, which you know account for over half of the global fee pool, uh, down a bit from from last year, but still at 51 percent of the overall fee pool and. That has changed a bit over time, but has been consistently strong, um, you know, since we've been tracking this this fee data, uh, you know, as I said in, in 2000. Again, the the banking perspective from from Europe versus Asia, you know, we are seeing um, European banking fees as a percentage hitting an all time low in, in the first half of the year, and Asia eclipsing uh, Asia Pacific banks eclipsing, uh, you know, European banks for the for the first time on record. Um, you know, I did I did note here in the slide that it is a bit more of a captive market in Asia, where when we're seeing a lot of domestic firms, domestic Asia and domestic Chinese firms, um, you're kind of really picking up share in the Chinese market, you know, with Chinese issuers and uh, and Asia Pacific issuers, and so you know that's an interesting one to see how that might play out, whether or not you know there are changes in you know how banking is done or how it kind of some of the, the non-domestic firms might make inroads into that fee pool which is growing you know certainly from a bond perspective and an equities perspective um, but it is it is a much more captive environment um, so you know kind of looking at the interplay between the domestic banks it, you know, might be a more interesting analysis um, but it's not necessarily a competitive uh, space for some of the the non-domestic firms certainly and so you know that that interplay is interesting to see and how that might change you know over time depending on how some of the capital markets trends um, develop, but an interesting trend nonetheless as, as we do see some of the European banks, you know, certainly um, kind of retreating from some of the key areas um, and, and seeing some of that share um, move from, from different regions. From an M&A perspective, you know, looking at the, you know, the, the type of, uh, the type of advisory work that's happening here, and we are seeing um, boutiques, um, which again have, have really risen um, to prominence over the last decade plus now. Um, but you know the boutiques accounting for 35 percent of the overall fee pool uh, in in the first half of the year um, the top five banks uh, accounting for 34 percent and then the remaining share um, you know kind of at that at that 31 percent that 31 percent mark and you can see you know a number of um, you know the, the the top five banks really kind of kind of kind of really increasing their share since really since 2019. Um, really, you know, coming at parity with you know a very large group of boutiques who are doing you know, many types of transactions across different regions and across different sectors. But you know, we have seen a number of, of large transactions complete this year with no boutiques on them. So uh, some some pretty large deals with you know uh, uh, some of the, the you know the bigger bulge brackets um, in, in a very competitive environment. And I think you know as we've said over the course of um, you know the the last number of webcasts. You know, a down M&A market is one that you know a lot of the boutique firms and independent firms have has not seen necessarily. Um, so, depending on which sector, depending on kind of where their um, you know where their focus might be, um, you know, a, a downturn in, in announced M&A or you know a continued or prolonged downturn in announced or completed M&A transactions, you know, might have a, a different effect on this number because we really have seen you know uh, you know just the general trend line being you know, kind of very much more on the up to plateauing over the course of, of the last number of years. And so we're now we're on a little bit of a, a down a downward trajectory. So it'll be interesting to watch and how that how that um, how that affects certainly those firms and what might happen in that space, whether we see consolidation or um, you know some acquisitions happening in the space or other other types of, of activity. But uh, I'll pass it over to Lucille now to dig into the real factors that are pushing M&A activity um, and, and really kind of you know kind of uh, impacting the first half of the year from a deal making perspective. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. So um, last year, M&A hit the highest level since our records began back in 1980. Um, we actually recorded $5.7 trillion worth of M&A transactions globally last year. 
um, which is nearly 40% more than the previous annual record set in 2015. Um, and the third and fourth quarters of last year each passed the $1.5 trillion mark um, for the first time. Um, steelmakers were uh, very comfortable pursuing the M&A agenda again um, after a, a sort of short-lived drop-off in activity at the start of the pandemic. Um, but, but this year we've seen quite a significant slowdown. Um, M&A reached $2.1 trillion during the first half of 2022, and that's down 21% from the same period last year, um, and with a 15% drop in the number of deal announcements. Um, while this is a pronounced drop from last year, we should remember that last year, um, as Matt was saying when we were looking at fees, was you know it was record-breaking in every way and, and certainly an outlier. Um, if we compare to previous first half totals, the um, the chart here on the left, um, you can see that we are still running um, at an historically very high level, somewhere sort of between 2018, 2019, the pre-pandemic levels, um, and um, we are actually um, the the first half of this year is actually the fourth highest first half by dollar value, and the second highest by number of deals um, since our records began. Um, it does feel like the deal making environment has changed, though. Um, the sort of boardroom confidence that we saw last year has been knocked um, by volatile stock markets, concerns about you know uh, rising interest rates, inflation, um, and of course the conflict in Ukraine. Um, we didn't start the year this way. Um, we know from our dealmaker sentiment survey that we conducted at the end of last year in November um, that dealmakers went into 2022 in a, in a very optimistic mood um, and that companies were looking to grow and expand. Um, we actually saw more than 700 billion worth of M&A transactions announced in January and February. Um, it was the largest opening two-month period for global M&A since the year 2000. So, you know, a very strong start. Um, but the outbreak of hostilities in Ukraine um, really prompted a decline towards the end of February and into March. Um, and the first quarter of this year um, ended up being the lowest uh, quarterly uh, total since the start of the pandemic. Um, but we did see an uptick in Q2, as you can see there in the charts on the right. Um, so... Uh, despite the slowdown, M&A activity is still pushing past the $1 trillion mark, um, and that's the eight, con eight consecutive quarters now that we've seen uh, global M&A hit that level or pass that level. Um, and first half deal making is up 5% from pre-pandemic 29 levels. So as I said before, although down from this recent run of deal making, both by value and by number of deals, we're still at, highly elevated, at a highly elevated level compared to previous years. Um, conditions are still somewhat favourable for M&A uh, with strong corporate balance sheets and historically low interest rates, but dealmakers are more pessimistic about the economic outlook and I think companies and boards will be making sure that they, um, that they have rainy day plans in place um, and there will be less confidence and, and appetite for acquisitions. Um, in terms of regions, um, the U.S. continued to dominate, accounting for 43% of global M&A activity during the first six months of this year. Um, that's down from around half during the same period last year. Um, Europe accounted for 25% and Asia-Pacific accounted for 23%, um, both gaining share from last year. All regions saw a decline in activity, um, with the U.S. actually falling the furthest. You can see the... Um, US, the blue line there, saw deals worth over $900 billion, um, during the first half, and that's down 30% year on year, um, and actually with an 18% fall in the number of deals as well. Um, so the sharpest decline in M&A at the um, uh, start of 2020 as COVID-19 hit, but also a really good sort of rebound, as you can see there, um, during the second half of 2020, and, and um, hitting incredible highs last year. We saw almost 700 billion in the second quarter of 2021, um, but now we've seen a decline for four consecutive quarters. Um, we see a lot of the big ticket M&A deals come out of the US, 
Um, so when these announcements pause in times of uncertainty, it can really swing the value of, of, of M&A in the US. Um, and the, the blank check boom as well also fueled deal making the US last year. Uh, but that's largely died down and, and we'll, we'll look at that more a bit later. So 30% down from this time last year, but, um, you know, a stress again that we're down to a very elevated point in time and we're still at a very high level compared to historic first half. Um, European deals here in Orange um, saw a sharper drop in activity from the end of last year. Um, you know, we, we saw the conflict in European soil and that shocked the region. Um, we have seen a slight uptick since though, um, and we're currently down just 3% year to date. Um, and then in Asia Pacific, um, the green line, um, we are currently down 5% year to date. Um, and also seeing a slight uptick in the most recent quarter. Um, I just move it to um, a slightly longer view now. So this is looking at quarterly volumes back just over four decades um, to 1980. And um, you can see the sort of highs and lows over time, both by value and by number of deals here. Um, and you can see the growth in deal making at the end of the 90s and, and the decline after the dot-com boom and, and then bust around 2000. Um, and we had that quite long U-shaped recovery um, until the financial crisis when, again, we saw um, deal-making affected quite significantly, uh, but then returned steadily to this prolonged period of elevated levels, really until the, um, the sharp drop of activity in the second quarter of 2020 um, at the onset of the pandemic. But this was very quickly and, and, and unexpectedly followed by a sharp rebound in the third quarter. Um, we recorded in excess of 15,000 deals in the final quarter of 2020 um, and during the next four quarters, peaking at more than 17,000 deals um, in Q4 of last year. Um, and then we do drop down. You can see the, um, the number of deals come down in the last couple of quarters. We had 14,000 deals announced during the first quarter of this year and just under 13,000 during Q2. Again, pretty high when you look back historically, but the lowest quarterly total in eight quarters. Um, so, um, so what next? Um, I don't think we'll be surprised by another V-shaped recovery, but um, you know, as I said before, some of the factors that fueled deal making last year remain, um, but the deal making environment has undoubtedly changed. Um, so now we're going to dig into some of the different areas of the market, starting with mega deals. Um, so we classify mega deals as deals valued at five billion US dollars or more, um, and these deals have really dri driven the value of M&A um, over the past few years. The dollar value of M&A. Um, we saw M&A mega deal announcements drop significantly at the start of the pandemic. Um, you know, big deals that had been planned were postponed. Um, as companies hesitated to commit um, in uncertain times. Um, and then mega deals returned over the summer of 2020, um, supported by you know, economic recovery and, and lifting of lockdown. Um, and the deals have kept coming ever since. Um, we actually finished 2021 with a total of 174 mega deal announcements, um, which was 45 more than the previous record set in 2015. Uh, the first quarter of this year, we saw 27 deals in this high value category. It was actually the first quarter to see less than 30 mega deals since the second quarter of 2020 um, at the height of the pandemic. Um, we have seen a slight uptick in Q2. Um, and um, I should note that these figures do not include withdrawn M&A deals. So we're not including, for example, the Twitter deal that was pulled a couple of weeks ago um, and others. Um, so, so far this year, we've seen 58 mega deals during the first half compared to 79 during the same period last year. Um, it, it's quite a significant drop, but it's more in line with previous first half levels of activity, um, sort of going down to around uh, 2014. Um, larger deals, um, we, you know, we tend to see um, they are a trait of a, uh, of a more confident market where buyers have the conviction to make these larger investments. Um, interestingly, we have seen a strong showing of deals worth more than um, 10 billion US dollars. We've actually seen 25 deals in this category, um, which is just one less than last year. 
Um, and they weren't all announced at the start of the year as well. Um, they've been kind of evenly spread throughout the first half of this year, um, with half of them announced in the second quarter. So we're still seeing very sort of good activity in this um, high high deal value space. Um, now, this chart looks at um, cross-border deals, international deals, um, and it's a, a quarterly view here going back to 1990. Um, again, with the ups and downs coinciding with boom and recessionary periods, um, it tends to be another category um, that really takes off when times are good um, because cross-border deals are more risky in nature, and, and so they're another trait of a more confident market. Um, and you can see here that cross-border deal making fell sharply in 2020. Um, but then, again, it was followed by a big rebound in activity in the second half of the year. Um, and um, very high levels of activity were recorded throughout the whole of 2021. We saw the number of cross-border deals exceed 4,000 times. Um, um, so, sorry, exceed 4,000 for the first time um, during Q1 of 2021. And, and we actually exceeded that number every single quarter until the most recent call, so two, Q2 of this year. Um, and, and we were only 50 deals shy of the 4,000 mark. So we're still seeing, you know, very high level um, deal announcements here. Um, there has absolutely been a decline, um, but actually mainly by value. Um, so cross-border deals total almost 700 billion so far during 2022, or during the first six months. And that's down 50, 15% compared to the first half of 2021. Um, the number of deals we're seeing remains high. We're above 8,000 deals um, for only the second time since our records began um, and uh, just 6% below last year. Buyers in the US are driving a lot of this activity. Um, they alone initiated more than a third of all acquisitions abroad during the quarter. Um, Canada, the UK, Australia and France were the next most acquisitive nations. Um, and then from a target perspective, the US is also the most popular destination for cross-border deals, um, and it accounts for around a fifth of global activity, followed by the UK with 13%. Um, so cross-border deals continue to feature in 2022. They account for 32% of global M&A um, by value so far this year, um, which is actually a little bit up from last year, where they accounted for 30%. Um, now let's take a little look at sectors. So here is first half M&A um, volumes by target sector in the blue, uh, or sort of turquoise colour, um, and a comparison to the first half of last year underneath in the grey. Um, and once again, technology is by far the leading sector. Um, it's you know, way out in front by both value and by number of deals actually as well. Um, we have seen a decline in tech deals from last year, down 25% in value to just under 500 billion, um, but still you know, very, very high level in this um, sector. Uh, tech deals account for almost a quarter of global deal making during the first half of this year, um, slightly down from last year. The number of tech deals has also declined, so um, down 18%, but we saw more than 6,000 deals, which is 65% more than the closest sector industrials, which saw around 3,600 3, deals in the first half. So technology really leading by value and by volume, um, and it has done for some time now, actually. Um, tech has been the leading sector by number of deals every single month for 13 months now, so um, two and a half years. Uh, digital adoption was accelerated by the pandemic, and, and this spurred on a lot of activity in the sector. And we've seen some really big tech deals this year. So we saw um, Microsoft offer for video game developer Activision Blizzard. Um, and we saw Broadcom's plan to buy VMware. Um, and both of these deals are worth more than 60 billion US dollars. So after tech, um, we have the industrial sector down just 3% from last year. Um, it was boosted by a bid of more than $50 billion for Italian infrastructure group Atlantia. Um, by Blackstone and the Benetton family. Um, then we have financials, uh, real estate and energy and power. Um, and down at the bottom, we have consumer and retail. Um, actually, with the exception of retail, sorry, with the exception of real estate, 
um, every sector saw declines in both the number and the value of deals from the first half of 2021. Um, now, here's a list of the largest deals of the first half, and this list is very indicative of the quarter so far. So we can see the prominence of the US. Um, remember, US deals accounted for 43% of global deal making so far this year. Um, and when we take a look at this list, um, eight of the 15 deals here involve a US target. Um, four are European. Uh, we've got Atlantia up there in fourth place and, and Blackstone's investment in uh, Wildway in sixth. Um, we also saw um, some Asian deals pop into the list. Um, in Q2 um, after a sort of notable absence of Asian deals in Q1. Um, so we have uh, three of those in the list as well now. Um, another thing that I noticed about this list is the, um, the absence of SPAC deals, the SPAC business combinations um, that featured so strongly last year um, as this area of the market boomed. Um, but, but now we don't see a single SPAC deal um, we didn't see one make it into the top 20 deal list this year, so um, they tend to be a lot smaller. Um, and then all of the sectors that featured highly on the previous chart, they're all here. So we have tech, industrials, financial, real estate, et cetera. Um, topping the list is Microsoft's offer for Activision Blizzard, um, which was announced in January followed closely by Broadcom's offer for cloud computing company VMware. Um, these two deals, along with India's HDFC Bank um, planned acquisition of Housing Development Finance Corp, um, are each worth in excess of 60 billion US dollars. Um, and I also noticed that the largest five deals of the first half were announced in the second quarter. And one last thing pops out of this list, um, and that's the number of private equity back deals. So we have here Atlantia, Mileway, Ramsey Healthcare, Citrix and more. Private equity continues to, you know, feature strongly and this brings me nicely to the next slide. Um, so private equity volumes, um, again, a, a very significant story over the last couple of years. Um, in terms of value, buyout groups have backed $560 billion worth of deals in the first six months of the year, which is 2% more than the same period last year, um, and actually the highest first half total since our records began. Um, these firms have raised a record levels of um, you know, uh, capital over the last few years, and they've really been putting their money to work. If we look at the, the sheer number of transactions, we had more than 15,000 uh, P back deals last year, which was easily an all time annual record. Um, we have seen the quarterly numbers tick down from the end of last year, but we're still running at pace with, with um, over 6,000 deals announced during the first half of the year. Private equity MA accounts for 26% of global uh, deal making by value, um, and uh, that's a record share. And so, you know, it's a, a very big driver of M&A so far this year. And we're still seeing fundraising as well. So interesting to see how and where that capital will be deployed throughout the rest of the year. Um, and then here, something that I've mentioned a couple of times already is um, SPAC, special purpose, um, special purpose Acquisition Company, is one of the key hallmarks of last year. Um, and a three theme that really took off um, sort of the, the, the second half of 2020. They are the shell companies that raise funds by relisting with the sole purpose of acquiring a private company to take it public. Um, and we saw more than 300 SPAC combinations in 2021. Um, activity did slow down towards the end of the year, but these deals accounted for 10% of global M&A activity last year. So, you know, a, pr a pretty significant share. This year's SPAC combinations account for just 3% of total global m and We saw just 99 business combinations during the first half worth $65 billion, US dollars, which is down more than 80% from this time last year. Um, you know, we've seen a real reversal of enthusiasm that we saw for SPACs at the start of last year um, after a string of poor performance and, and heightened security, heightened regulatory uh, scrutiny. 
a definite you know change in investor sentiment sentiment for these blank check companies um we estimate that there are um you know there, there, are, there are still hundreds of SPACs out there looking for a business combination so we expect that there still will be activity here um and it, and it all starts with the SPAC listing which is where i'll pass you to matt um, as he starts to walk you through some of the capital market trends. Great, thank you. And a perfect, perfect handoff here, where you know we see um, you know, the, the chart on the left as far as the overall stack IPO activity that we saw in in 2021. Um, you know, a really unbelievable amount of activity. Um, you know, new public company formation. Um, and, and those companies instantly going out and looking to uh, acquire a business. And so that was a, a huge driver of, you know, much of the investment banking activity last year for many, many banks and, 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 and advisory firms who were, you know, taking companies public and instantly looking for acquisitions or, you know, having customers or, and, and clients, um, you know, to sell to, to potential SPACs. Um, you know, as the note says here, uh, 102 SPACs went public in the first half of 2022. So still, you know, pretty, pretty significant number of of, of IPOs, um, down 87 percent compared to a year ago, um, raising 14.1 billion. Um, and we do estimate, as Lucille said, um, you know, over 700 SPACs still looking for a combination. Um, you know, as those that have been formed over the last two years or so. Um, and so, you know, I think. Uh, you know, a very still an interesting aspect of the market, just because there are there is still capital there, um, and and there is still capital being raised even uh, in the in the first six months of, of this year. But also as noted, you know, a lot more scrutiny around regulatory details. Um, you know, some banks you know having um, you know some some stricter criteria around activity in in the space. Um, you know, and then you know, obviously you know some some pretty high profile um, you know kind of uh, you know kind of wind down certainly with the Lackman and and his vehicle um, but then other 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 combinations having to restate some earnings um, and others you know uh, having some some more difficulty in, in other areas of, of the law so again I think still 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 a place to to watch particularly because um, that capital is still still available but just you know with uh, obviously a different a different overview um, than than we saw in the the last 12 months or so. Um, from an overall equity capital markets perspective, as I noted in the open, you know, with, with fees, um, we have seen, you know, a, a real significant pullback um, for most of this year. Global ECM activity, so, you know, IPOs, follow-ons, and convertible bonds down 66% compared to a year ago, um, the slowest first half since 2005, um, and global IPOs leading much of that down 67%, um, and the number of listings down 45% globally. Um, and so, you know, the the amount of movement that we've seen, um, you know, in global indices around the world, the volatility certainly, um, you know, the, the the overall kind of uh, you know kind of environment that you would need um, to take companies public, you know, has been you know, quite hampered by you know the overall macro environment. And and last year, you know, obviously was also a very strong year for traditional IPOs. We saw, um, you know, in many many listings on exchanges all around the world. Uh, you know the the question certainly in the U.S., which was you know could the you know the, the traditional IPO market come back to levels that we had seen previously um, in 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 other kind of key um, you know, kind of key you know, kind of kind of bull markets um, you know could you see you know over 100 200 300 traditional IPOs in a year you know we did see that last year and so it did kind of prove that the the infrastructure of the IPO market wasn't necessarily the one. Uh, piece that was broken, uh, maybe with other factors, um, you know, certainly around M&A activity and competition and, um, you know, other other details. So, you know, obviously, you know, we, last year did prove that, you know, that, that the IPO model, you know, can, you know, can certainly work um, in an environment where, you know, you know, some of those stories uh, are making sense and, and the traditional investor roadshow and, and, and that process is, is, is making sense. And obviously, with competition from SPACs and, and other vehicles last year. But, you know, again, in the, the environment that we're seeing right now, um, from a company perspective, from an overall macro perspective, from a you know kind of stock market perspective, you know not ideal for um, you know, for for ECM, and we're certainly seeing that um, you kind of move through um, certainly in these numbers, these charts, um, and you know it will be interesting to see kind of what might potentially bring back that IPO activity. Certainly, as we end the summer, post Labor Day is usually a traditional window for IPO activity. Um, many colleagues, particularly some of my colleagues at 
IFR and our editorial teams within Refinitiv um, not really seeing, you know, kind of you know, a, a, a strong build. But, um, you know, again, that, that, that calendar um, can change depending on, on market opportunity. <clears throat> From a debt perspective, um, you know, the, the rise of, of, of debt capital markets post-financial crisis is, um, is really you know, kind of really, a, you know, a slow and steady story until you get into uh, 2020 and 2021 where we saw, you know, the debt capital markets um, and, and the debt market really come to the rescue of, of many companies around the world, um, certainly with interest rates, um, you know, and, and many of the moves from central banks from an interest rate perspective and also from, um, you know, a you know, overall policy perspective and, and bond buying programs and, and many of the factors that were part of the pandemic recovery and kind of really you know, kind of pumping up those numbers, uh, in, you know, over the last two years. And so, you know, with the, you know, the onset of, of a new environment for interest rates this year, Certainly, a newer environment in general for for debt. Um, you know, we are seeing uh, you know a decline compared to a year ago. So overall, across every debt category, um, corporate bonds, the agencies, sovereigns, as well as securitizations, uh, you know, totaling 4.7 trillion in the first half of the year, down 12 uh, percent compared to uh, compared to a year ago. Investment grade, you know, from a quarterly perspective, falling below a trillion for the first time in uh, in six quarters. Uh, from a year-to-date perspective, down 7% globally. Um, investment grade in the U.S., which is you know one of the, the largest and, and biggest U.S. dollar markets, down 11% compared to a year ago. And then high yield, which you would expect um, would have a, you know a, you know kind of a, 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 an interesting you know, kind of uh, reckoning as far as interest rates and, and, and the environment and the, t- the types of companies that are in the, the high yield market, down 78% compared to um, compared to a year ago, and and that quarterly total. Uh, is the lowest in in over a decade. So, you know, I think from a from a DCM perspective, I think we'll continue to to still see uh, activity. Um, you know, certainly, the interest rate environment is you know from a relative perspective is still is still quite attractive, um, and and we have seen some some big issuance coming out um, from from both just general refinancing, but then also um, from M and A activity, which you know has been also a big part of of this market. Um, you know, from a from a corporate perspective and also from a private equity perspective where we, we have seen, you know, a very friendly market for, for that activity. And we are also seeing a little bit of a change, the interplay between uh, the bond market and the loan market. Um, and obviously in a, in a rising interest rate environment, um, you know, the loan market, uh, you know, might have a, a larger percentage or proportion of some of the financing needs, you know, as, as, uh, as CFOs and, and, and treasurers are looking at um, their overall financing needs for the next couple of years and trying to figure, you know, how they might, um, you know, have a, have a space in, in that market. So, again, I think, you know, you not a surprise to see that decline, certainly as M&A pulls back a bit um, and, and obviously an inflection point from an overall interest rate perspective. Um, you know, I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll watch this, this market closely, particularly um, over the coming second half of the year. Um, the newest part of the bond market um, you know, that we've been closely watching for the last uh, coming up on really two years now is the, the world of sustainable finance. So looking at sustainable finance activity, um, and many of the different products and issuers that are in that space. Um, so starting from green bonds and then moving into sustainability and, and, and social bonds, which um, we saw really you know, kind of come in a very strong way over the course of, of, of the pandemic and, and the recovery, where many you know, kind of corporates as well as agencies and sovereigns were using the bond market you know, for pandemic relief, um, you know, for social and sustainable uh, kind of programs. Um, you know, so you can see, you know, kind of we are – seeing a year-over-year decline, down 23% compared to a year ago, and that's across all categories. Um, but, but in Q2, we did see an increase compared to the first, uh, the first half of, of, of uh, or the first quarter of, uh, of this year, up, up 9%. But you know, a really interesting space that, that, we're, that we're really watching you know, kind of quite closely because there's many different products that are, that are popping up, new, new types of transactions. Um, we are seeing, you know, a real increase in the, um, you know, kind of the sustainable linked categories, both from a bond and a loans perspective, um, where you know, green green bonds, which have been, you know, kind of the longest and, and most prolific um, in, in the category, you know, you know, the first green bond coming in, in 2015, and then obviously sustainability and social bonds kind of, you know, kind of coming up as, as we've seen you know, kind of more issuance and and certain guide, guidelines and, and, and principles in, in that space, um, you know. But historically, much of it has been a use of proceeds story. So we're we're going to use the proceeds for something, in you know, green or sustainable or social purpose. 
Um, and I think the, the linked market, which we are seeing grow, um, you know, kind of as a, as, a, as a subset of this market where, you know, issuers and investors and, and, and their advisors and underwriters are, are, are committing to a certain amount of coupon payment or penalty for not meeting particular KPIs and particular, particular payments. And I think that shift is a little bit of a, you know, is, is an interesting shift from, you know, kind of here's the use of proceeds that we're, here's, here's what we hope to use the proceeds for as opposed to, you know, here are some real metrics that we can use to be measured. And if we don't meet those measurements, um, you know, there are there are you know benefits for you as an investor. Um, you know, and so I think that's an interesting dynamic that we're starting to see. Uh, you know, take up a larger percentage of the market in both the bond market and the sustainable loan market. So certainly one to watch here. You know, in, in in the rising interest rate environment, I would expect. You know, I think you know, you know certainly you know kind of the the corporate um, you know kind of view to kind of look at you know kind of how to you know you know you know kind of you know, basically convince investors to continue to invest in, the, in this green or sustainable or social aspect. Um, and certainly um, looking at the commitment that, that many banks have made, you know, I don't, I don't expect that this, that this market will go away, but, you know, you might see some different, you know, some different dynamics happening as uh, interest rates continue to rise and, 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 and CFOs and treasurers need to decide, you know, kind of how, how their, what their debt profile might look like. And then as we begin to see some of these transactions that were priced in, you know, in 2020, 21, um, begin to mature and come up for refinancing or, you know, kind of how that might work, you know, what transparency is given around the use of proceeds and what did the, what did the capital do for a green or sustainable or social purpose? So, um, you know, I think I, I would expect to also see some, you know, potential um, discussions around some of that transparency in, as some of these, you know, kind of inaugural, inaugural issuers that we saw over the last two years potentially come back to the market in, in some way and, and how that, how that you know, becomes part of the process as we move forward in the sustainable finance world. We are also tracking sustainable finance activity you know, across all the different groups, so lending, ECM, and M&A. Um, you know, not a surprise to see uh, you know a, a pretty significant decline in sustainable ECM, and and this is based on you know companies and and the business the businesses that, that are companies in. We have we have products um, you know for, certainly in the bond market, and we've also seen um, sustainable convertible bonds um, we, and and other other types of transactions. But you know, also looking at the types of companies that are that are in the equity market or the M&A market, um, you know, a, a subset of, of the overall um, kind of asset class that, that, we're, that we are tracking. Um, you know, lending kind of up a bit uh, compared to, um, you know, compared to a year ago. But again, I think, you know, this is a market that will continue to watch as we as we look, um, you know, for, um, you know, kind of any kind of new innovation in, in the space and certainly, um, you know, kind of regulatory um, or just, you know, kind of general you know, kind of key themes. I um, mean, obviously a very, very hot topic um, across many investment communities. Uh, and so, you know, the, the investment bank and capital markets world, you know, certainly not, not one to be left out of that. So one that we'll continue to watch and track, um, certainly as the kind of inflection point that I mentioned, um, you know, continues to, uh, you know, con continues to uh, you know, kind of evolve uh, over the coming uh, quarters and years. So with that, I think uh, that is a 45-minute you know, deep dive into the world of deal making. We will make the slides available to all who registered uh, and, and attended. Um, we thank you so much for your joining for you joining us today, and we look forward to speaking with you again uh, at the end of Q3.